When you look at a bench and you see one instrument, you instantly know that somebody is doing electronics, and that instrument is the oscilloscope. When Rhoda and Schwartz asked if I wanted to check out their new MX-04, I could not wait to get my hands on it. And I can honestly say the MX-04 is the most impressive oscilloscope I have ever used. In this video, I show how it acquires 4 million waveforms per second, its ridiculously low noise floor, its incredibly fast FFT, we take a look inside of it, and a bunch more. So oscilloscope fans and wizards, let's get started. The MX-04 starts at 200 MHz with bandwidth options up to 1.5 GHz. All four analog channels sample at 2.5 giga samples per second, with two sampling at 5. The ADCs are 12-bit all the time, with each channel having 400 mega points of memory. And it has a full bandwidth, two-stage digital trigger. It supports up to 16 digital channels and has an optional two-channel arbitrary waveform generator that operates up to 100 MHz. There are USB ports on the front and back, along with USB device, Ethernet, and HDMI. There is also a trigger out and BNC to accept or connect a 10 MHz time-based reference. Let's address the 6 kilogram box in the room. Yes, I know not everybody watching this video is in the market for an oscilloscope or one of this class. For you, I hope that you can enjoy seeing what a cutting-edge oscilloscope can do. Most scope manufacturers have grouped their scopes into classes with roughly the same bandwidth ranges. For RNS, the MX-04 replaces their RTA-4000 and is a step up from the RTM that I have used the past few years. Oscilloscopes in this class have four, usually five digits in the price, regardless of the manufacturer. Since most of you probably don't get to use a scope like this, let me show you three things that sets it apart from everything else. Acquisition update or trigger rate is how fast the oscilloscope can capture waveforms and display them on the screen. Your average run-of-the-mill low-end scope can only do a couple hundred at best. Roden Schwartz says that the MX-04 can do 4.5 million, which, if it's true, is an industry first. So, let's go see. In this setup, I connected the trigger out to my super modern frequency counter. Each time the MX-04 triggers, it generates a pulse. And we see 20 hertz. Huh, that isn't 4 million. Well, like most scopes out of preset, the trigger is in auto sweep. So without a valid trigger, the trigger rate is fundamentally limited to the auto timeout. However, when a signal like a sine wave is applied, everything changes. The screen is way more active and the frequency counter is now showing 4.5 million counts or triggers. You know what though? That signal is a little too clean. Turning on AM noise gives us a clear picture of how fuzzy this waveform really is. Even more impressive is if I turn on certain measurements, the update rate stays the same. For example, let's add a peak-to-peak -peak voltage measurement, and then turn on a digital low-pass filter, and finally enable color grading. All of those are on, and the update rate is still 4.5 million triggers per second. That update rate is impressive, even more so when you consider that it's not a special mode. It's the inherent architecture of the MXOEP that achieves that kind of performance. Now, even though it's not a special mode, there are cases where the acquisition rate will drop. For example, capturing two microseconds of data causes the update rate to drop to about 490,000. Uh, what's going on? Well, it's called math. Let me get some numbers. Uh, 10,000 sample points at five giga samples per second results in two microseconds or 500,000 waveforms per second. So the scope can't trigger any faster than that. But the ability to go that fast results in a very low dead time. In this case, about 32 nanoseconds between triggers. As the scope shows, it is watching our signal over 98% of the time. Second, some operations like turning on statistics drop it down even more. Granted, this is still very fast performance. Okay, so it can acquire waveforms really fast. Well, now let's go take a look at its noise performance. In short, the noise floor is what an oscilloscope measures even when no signal is connected. Any signals inside of this floor cannot be reliably measured. With one gigahertz of bandwidth, the volts per division at 500 microvolts and all four channels turned on, the AC armist noise is around 90 microvolts. The data sheet says 98 microvolts. 
By the way, that 500 microvolts per division is a hardware setting. Now, some oscilloscopes will say they can do one or two millivolts per division, but it's actually their four or five millivolt per division setting with software scaling. For day-to-day -day measurements, let's change the channels to 50 millivolts per division. And now we see the noise is in the 900 millivolt range with the data sheet saying one millivolt. And now let's move on to do a quick compare of multiple bandwidths. Here I am turning on a different digital low pass filter for each channel. This capability is helpful if you're measuring fast and slow signals at the same time. Channels 1, 3, and 4 with the respective bandwidths match and exceed the datasheet values, but channel 2 is measuring more than 700 microvolts while the datasheet says 543 microvolts. But the datasheet also says something about HD mode for 500 megahertz and below. Here is channel 2 as before, but by itself. Now I'll press the HD button and the noise drops to 560-ish microvolts which is a significant improvement, but it is still slightly higher than the datasheet. I'm actually not quite sure what to make of that difference. It's slightly higher than the datasheet, which could just be how I set up the measurement, or maybe I need to realign the scope, or maybe I made a mistake. Regardless, it is still impressive performance. Back to HD mode, notice when we reduce bandwidth, the bit resolution goes up. HD mode not only reduces wideband noise, but it also increases the vertical resolution. Also notice, even with HD mode on, we're still acquiring over 2 million waveforms per second. Some of you might be thinking that HD mode is just waveform averaging. Check out this example. This sine wave has random vertical noise. If I change the acquisition from sample to average and use 20 averages, the noise pretty much goes away. And just to see the difference a little bit better, if I turn on persistence, you can really tell that the noise is gone. But that noise was actually part of our waveform. So waveform averaging is just throwing it away, which is a terrible idea. Instead, using HD mode at 100 megahertz, we get a 16-bit resolution. And now the noise we see is actually in the waveform. So far, they can acquire waveforms really fast with low noise and high resolution. Now let's take a look at what happens when an RF company makes an oscilloscope's FFT function. I think most people avoid using an FFT or fast Fourier transform on an oscilloscope because it's usually slow and kind of clunky. However, check this out. Hitting the spectrum button, notice two things. First, the spectrum is very clean. There are no spurs, significant or otherwise, in the spectrum. If you don't know much about gauging an oscilloscope's performance, especially in the frequency domain, that FFT plot is amazing. Also notice we're triggering over 30,000 times per second, and that's with 100,000 samples. Again, that's a big deal, and it's fast, even for an RNS oscilloscope. So let's take these three unique things and combine them into a single measurement known as EMI debug. Using a near-field probe, I am moving around a Raspberry Pi 3, and you can see some high-frequency stuff over here. If we failed an EMC test with one of these frequencies, we could find out which chip or component is emitting the interference. Now when we check out the stuff over by this USB connector, we can see some serious noise here. In fact, that switching pattern looks very familiar to me. Does it look familiar to you? I'm confident it is the power supply, so I'll use HD mode to band limit and get a higher vertical resolution, and wait a minute, the scope stopped triggering. The triggering stops because HD mode and the digital trigger are happening in real time during acquisition inside of the MXOEP chip. So the digital trigger system is seeing the band limited signal. So we have to adjust the trigger for the band limited signal and last, change the spectrum's stop frequency to 20 megahertz. And now we can see some significant spurs at 1.5 megahertz and its harmonics. So either that switching noise is coming from the USB host or it's coming from the Pi, but that's a measurement for another day. For now, let's go take a look inside of the oscilloscope. Yeah, this feels much more familiar. All right, so good news is there are no special screws and it looks like we're gonna just start with these four and see what happens. This isn't gonna work. Take two. I didn't realize this, but the feet actually extend. Probably keeps it from tipping over. 
cool. So this looks like it's just like a USB port <laughs> to this board. I cut myself. Go figure. Holy cow. Front end modules have got to be under here. I wonder if these snap off. <laughs> yeah, they do. Yeah, so there's that's probably like the front end preamp. Relays for like uh, attenuation stages and uh, AC coupling cap. This looks like the signal path back to here. These are probably the samplers. As I'm looking at the board, it just now occurred to me, there's no separate PC. In fact, I'm actually thinking this is the CPU and this is the RAM for the CPU. So that's kind of interesting. I was expecting a, um, a standalone computer. Eventually, I turned my attention to the largest chip on the board, which is the MXO EP that I keep talking about. What an understated chip. <laughs> it just says Roden Schwartz on it. <laughs> oh. So the front end stuff is in here, and then it goes through the ADC, and then the ADC is connected to here, which is, this has got to be the MXOEP. MXOEP, this is probably the RAM for it, and then this is probably all connected to over here, which I think is the CPU side. But I wonder what this does. There's a SD, micro SD card slot over here, another HDMI style port here, but there's nothing on the side. I wonder if these are for debug. After shooting a bunch of footage and taking a bunch of pictures, I put the scope back together. And I'm happy to report that I had zero problems whatsoever. It went together the first time, turned on no problem, and I didn't make any mistakes when I was trying to make sure that it worked okay. Mm -mm. Before I took the scope apart, I fully expected to see a well-designed board, and I did. Uh, the one thing that I'm still kind of amazed about is just how much integration there is. There's only a handful of chips in the entire design. That's just incredible. Okay, let's take a look at some things I like and didn't like about the scope. Remember that the digital trigger system runs in real time during acquisition. Working off the digital samples means the smallest glitch that it can detect is one sample period. Also, since there isn't an analog comparator, hysteresis can be set to zero volts or almost anything you want. And the MXO has a two stage or sequence trigger with reset. History mode is standard. This feature lets you stop the scope and then cycle back in time through previous acquisitions. Here, we captured one character of a serial sequence per trigger. With history mode, we can go back and see each one of those characters one at a time. This is one of the most clever ways to make use of that standard deep acquisition memory. Just to recall back to that spectrum stuff I talked about like five minutes ago, I really, really like the spectrum analyzer like controls for the FFT. Also, changing frequency domain settings never seems to mess up the time domain settings, which isn't always the case in other scopes. Protocol decode at the time of this video is limited to I2C, UART, and SPY. Additional protocols are expected with a future firmware update. So I'm glad it has protocol decode, but I wish there were more available. One way to make use of the built-in 100 MHz arbitrary waveform generator is with a frequency response analysis. This feature quickly generates Bode plots for a filter or measures the loop response of a power supply. Up at the top of the screen, there is a tab-like button called Display Set. Here, I have one where I'm using the spectrum view to see peaks, and then I have one with the analog channel, full screen, a zoom, and some measurements. This unique approach is much faster than loading new setups just to see the data in different formats. While the touchscreen user interface is fine, sometimes I just want to use a mouse. So I am glad that both USB keyboard and mice work as expected. One benefit of the keyboard is that it makes using the search box in the menu a little easier to use. Like PC operating systems, it's a fast way to find a feature when you cannot remember which menu it is in. 
Having an HDMI port on the back of the scope is a great way to attach a second monitor, projector, or capture device. It has been said by some people, including myself, that engineers only use 10 to 20% of their oscilloscope's features, which is why I was really happy to see the demo application. RNS has demonstrations of the MXO's more interesting features. Some of these demos use the built-in waveform generator to give you a live signal to play with, but you don't even have to connect a cable to explore them. And one more thing that I feel like they made just for me, but I don't know how because I just learned about it recently, is this. On the logic channels, high, low, and the edge are different colors. I laughed because the color choices look like the color artifacts from the Apple II video signal. Roden Schwartz did ask me for an honest review of the MX04, and since they gave me a scope, it's really hard for me to be unbiased. That said, let me mention a few of the minor things that I did not like about the scope. First, I appreciate that the scope is running Linux, but I'm not sure why it's locked down. I'd really like to use that HDMI port to have a KiCad PCB or screenshot or Stack Overflow loaded on another display. The FFT performance is fantastic, but it's also limited to a single channel. I'm pretty sure you can't use math as a source for it either. Also, I find it annoying it always defaulted to channel one. In fact, the cursors did the same thing. The waveform update is impressive, but I'm surprised how many things cause it to slow down like certain measurements. And while there are measurement statistics, there's no visual way to see them like a histogram. For the most part, the new user interface is very refined, and I appreciate it being understated, except in one area. I really wish when selecting channels in dropdowns that the text was the same color as the channels. It would help the channel selection pop when configuring measurements, the trigger, and other things. Oh, and when using a mouse, it got a little bit laggy. Like in this clip, I am moving the mouse immediately after clicking, but the movement is almost ignored. And last, on the front panel's trigger section, there is a zone button that does nothing, no matter how many times I press it. I actually have an idea of what that button does, and RNS did tell me it will be enabled in the future. I guess that's their way of making sure that I make another video about the scope. Now, I don't think any of the things that I just talked about are deal breakers, but I think they are things you should consider if you're looking at the MX-04. I don't think I'm going to surprise anyone by saying that I'm impressed with this scope. In fact, I think I started the video by saying exactly that. The hardware performance is fantastic, as you would expect from Rode and Schwartz. The feature set is on par, and in some cases better than their higher-end scopes, at least in my opinion. The trigger rate, noise performance, and FFT throughput are going to cause their competitors a very bad day. So we've taken a look at the fast update rate, the low noise performance, the incredible FFT stuff, we looked inside of the scope, and then I gave you my pros and cons about the scope. So let me know what you think about it, or if you have questions about oscilloscopes in this class, leave them with this video, or head over to the Atoms Discord server where we can discuss them in detail. For now, thanks for watching. I want to extend a big thank you to my friends at Roden Schwartz for giving me an early look at the MX-04. I really enjoyed getting to know this scope and making a video, so I hope you did too. If you wanna see some more oscilloscope related stuff that I've done, like for other channels, check the link over here, or is it over there? I never remember which side I put it on. Anyway, thanks for taking a look at this video and I'll see you around the internets.